Um, so yes, I am going to talk about brain control and energy balance, but you need to bear with me because I'm going to start in the skeleton and hopefully the reasons for this will become clear as we um, proceed. So first I just want to tell you a couple of things about the skeleton, that fascinating facts which I think you may not be aware of, a lot of people aren't aware of them. The first, sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> so the first is that the skeleton's not a static organ. It's actually constantly being broken down and rebuilt. So in the first year of your life, almost 100% of your skeleton is rebuilt. And of course this rate changes as you grow, but even in adults, about 10% of your skeleton is broken down every year and rebuilt. And this happens, oh, sorry. This happens in a very coordinated and balanced way. So you have cells called osteoclasts, which are a little bit like Pac-Men. They come along and they chew up a little bit of bone, just a small portion. And then when they're done, they call over their mates, the osteoblasts, and they come along and they rebuild the bone up. And this is all done in order to release minerals out of the bone into the circulation that might be needed by the body, and also to provide the skeleton a way of um, structurally changing as is needed. Now, as I mentioned, this needs to be balanced, and unfortunately sometimes the balance goes off and the rate of bone resorption is higher than the rate of bone formation. And this is when bone gets broken down faster than it can be rebuilt, and you get conditions like osteoporosis. So the second thing about the skeleton that's fascinating is that it's not silent. It actually is constantly communicating with other organs in the body. So not only do these osteoclasts and osteoblasts within the bone, they talk to each other in order to coordinate the process of bone remodelling. But bone is also directly controlled, or the process of bone remodelling is directly controlled by the brain. And this makes sense. I mean, the brain controls everything we do, so why not the skeleton? But what has become clear in recent years is that not only does the brain send signals to the bone, but the bone actually produces and sends signals back up to the brain. And not only does it send signals to the brain, but it directly sends signals to other organs, such as the pancreas, to control insulin and glucose um, in the body, and to muscle tissue and fat tissue. And so far, only a handful of the um, messengers that bone uses to coordinate, uh, sorry, to communicate throughout the body have been discovered. I'm sure there's more that we don't know about yet. Uh, but my favourite one is called osteoglycin, and it's my favourite because we discovered it here at the Garvin. <laughs> Um, and so we know that osteoglycin is produced in bone in response to signals from the brain and it directly goes to the brain and is involved in coordinating food intake. It also directly goes to the pancreas where it signals insulin production and also directly talks to muscle, muscle tissue. And the reason for this is all about energy. So the, brain, sorry, the bone is responding to signals from the brain telling it to grow and it says, okay, sure I'll grow but I need some energy. So help so it's, it's sending messages to the pancreas and to the muscle to try to get these energy stores that it needs in order to grow. And also in order to um, ensure that the skeleton is the sufficient, sufficient to support body weight. So this brings me to energy balance. What is energy balance? Well, it's the relationship between the energy that comes in in the, term, in, um, the form of food and drink that you consume compared to the energy that you use. And this is not just energy that you use in terms of physical activity, but your body uses energy in, term, uh, in order to maintain body temperature, to maintain your metabolism and other bodily functions. So if you have a situation where too much energy comes in and the body can use, then any excess energy has to be stored. And the body normally stores this in the form of fat. Conversely, if you don't have enough energy coming in, then the body needs to mobilise these energy stores out of fat tissue in order to have sufficient energy to fulfil its functions. So not only does this relationship determine whether weight is lost or gained or stays the same, but whether you're in a state of positive or ne negative energy balance really affects everything throughout your body in terms of your, um, including your hormonal balance, your mood, your metabolism. So it's a very complicated process and of course it also matters what form the energy is, that is in when it comes in and also how you expend the energy. Another aspect of energy balance that I'm interested in is the idea of energy partitioning. And this is the um, distribution of energy throughout the body to where it's needed and how that happens. And it's not a very well understood area. Well, what we do know is that energy balance starts in the brain and specifically in a region called the hypothalamus, which is a centre of the brain that's essential for coordinating both sides of energy balance. 
And so as I mentioned, if you have too much energy coming in, then your body can use. Um, any excess energy has to be stored, and usually in the form of fat. And if this is a prolonged situation, then um, you develop obesity. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you that we're in the midst of an obesity epidemic worldwide, with rates of obesity nearly tripled since 1975. In Australia in 2016, nearly 40% of adults were overweight and 13% were obese, and this, these numbers are only increasing. And of course there's also a growing um, epidemic of obesity in children, which is concerning. So not only is overweight, being overweight or obese of concern in itself, but it increases your risk of other health problems, such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular uh, diseases. So of course it's important to encourage healthy eating and increased exercise as ways to combat this problem. But unfortunately, a lot of the time, any weight that's lost through dieting or increased activity is often not maintained. And there really is um, a lack of alternative strategies to cope with this problem. So an aspect of obesity that I'm particularly interested in is the relationship between obesity and osteoporosis. So whenever your body weight increases, this necessitates an increase in bone mass in order to provide adequate structural support for the body. Uh, and this is what you would expect in a, say, a growing child as their, as their body weight increases and they grow, their skeleton has to keep growing to keep up. However, unfortunately, in obesity, this often doesn't happen. Um, and for reasons that aren't really very well known yet, but obese individuals often have an increased risk of osteoporotic fractures. And not only that, but their, their bone quality is actually poorer and um, they have poor bone health. So not only are they more at risk of getting a fracture, but when they have a fracture, their prognosis and their recovery is often worse. So a question I'm asking in my research at the moment is whether we can manipulate energy usage in order to aid the skeleton. So I'll bring you back up to the brain, to the hypothalamus, if you remember, is the centre that controls energy balance, energy in and energy out. And the um, most abundant peptide in the mammalian brain is something called neuropeptide Y, or NPY. Now, NPY is involved in just about everything. There's a range of functions from stress and anxiety to blood pressure and regulating reproduction. But its real main function is controlling appetite and body weight. And it's also directly enrolled in coordinating bone formation, which is why I'm interested in it. So basically, if you have a situation of low energy, your brain produces MPY, and it does this to signal to your body that you're hungry and make you eat. And then when you do eat, uh, the hormones in your gut send signals back up to the brain to turn this whole process down. Now, if you have a situation where there's excess en energy coming in, as I mentioned, your body needs to store it, and it usually stores it in the form of fat. Now, fat tissue itself produces a hormone called leptin. And leptin is produced uh, in direct relationship to the amount of fat you have. So the more fat you have, the more leptin you produce. And one of the things leptin does is it signals back up to the brain and turns down NPY. And it does this in order to stop more excess energy coming in. So as part of investigating uh, how this all works, we've created some mice. And in these mice, leptin can no longer turn down NPY. So it's missing the, what's called the leptin receptors, only in the brain, on the MPY neurons. So if you think of the receptors a little bit like a key, these mice produce MPY normally, and they produce leptin normally, but leptin no longer has the key to turn down MPY in the brain. And we find something really interesting with these mice when we put them on a high-fat diet. So we took the mice lacking the leptin receptors and some normal control mice, and we fed them a high-fat diet for eight weeks. And this is in order to induce... Um, a state of overweight or obesity, and the high-fat diet sort of replicates the, the problems with Western's diet at the moment in society. So what happens with these mice? Both mice, the um, ones lacking the leptin receptors and the control mice, increased their body weight, as we would expect on a high-fat diet. They both ate the same amount of food, and they had the same amount of energy expenditure in terms of their physical activity and their metabolism. But the ones lacking the leptin receptors didn't get nearly as fat or, sorry, I'll rephrase that. They had the same body weight, but their fat mass inside their body was different. So here in the grey, you have um, the normal control mice, and on the high-fat diet, they put on about 150%, increased their fat mass by about 150%. And in red, you can see the mice lacking the leptin receptors were nowhere near that. So although they had the same body weight, they had this decrease in fat mass. So where was the rest of the weight? Well, fascinatingly, 
they have a huge increase in bone mass. So they, these mice can eat the same amount of food and they can expend the same amount of food, but instead of storing it in fat, they're using it to produce extra bone in order to support the increase in body weight. So at the moment I'm trying to understand a little bit more about how this is all working, because if we can understand this, then perhaps we can develop a treatment strategy in order to improve bone health in overweight people at the same time as reducing their fat mass. So this way we could tackle both osteoporosis and obesity at the same time, which would just be amazing. Um, so thank you for your attention. I hope that made sense.